Welcome back, travelers, to another Viking loot video. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about Govek, and to be specific, we're going to do a playthrough and how to play Govek. No, skull, skull, skull. You don't know me, skull, the name. So I am joined here today by Mr. Andrew Valkowskis. And I am here with Mr. Ken, Superfly. Yeah, that's me. So uh, a lot of people have actually asked us how the game works. So we're going to unbox it and open it as well. And then uh, we're going to show you guys how the game works. So first of all, as you guys can see, box looks absolutely amazing. We do have the sky cam right here. So hopefully the lighting is not going to be too blinding. So I might have to adjust that. A little that. bit was, of the reflection. Yeah, I might have to adjust that while we're doing this. So uh, Andrew's going to show it to you. I'm going to look upwards. So uh, take a quick look at the art while we're doing this and I'm gonna try to adjust the lighting when we do that. Inside, what you're gonna find are two sets of rules. So the rules are really simple. They fit on a single page. So one set is, is in English, one set is in French. I've got the English set right here. So first page, second page, and then we'll move the French ones over here. Don't worry, you don't have to be bilingual to play this game. The deck of cards, there are 35 cards. So there are seven cards in five different clans. There is the Vanir clan, which are the old gods. You have the Rymjotuns, which are the ice giants, which are um, one of two giant factions. Then you've got the fire giants. Let's just check the sky cam. These guys are in, in screen. And then we have the Azer gods and we have the dwarves. So five different clans, seven cards in each clan. The way you win the game is to get the most points. And so you can set if you want the game to be long or short. Mm -hmm. So you could have a game that lasts, you know, 300 points, 400 points for a short game. That'll mm -hmm. be like 30 minutes. Uh, you want a longer game, 500 points. You want to make an evening out of it, you can pay it 1,000 points. Yes. All right? Now, the way you get those points is you take a look at the card anatomy here. The strength of the card is on this side. So every single one of these clans has the numbers going from 7 down to 1. Mm -hmm. And then you have the point value. Every, anywhere from 0 points all the way up to 11 points. So that's not the only way that you can gain points. The other way, if you notice, some of these cards actually have a banner at the top. That banner tells you which two cards can be comboed together to not only gain those points, but actually to give that clan supremacy. And that's akin to Trump mm -hmm. when you play like regular card mm -hmm. games. So in spades... Spades is the trump suit. Yeah. So when you play spades, it beats the other suit. So it's the same thing here. The principle of this game is a trick-taking game. So each round, a player plays a card. Whoever has the highest power gets to co collect the pile. Now, you have to follow the suit. So if I start and play this yellow suit, I have to play the yellow suit. I mean, the Azer God suit, sorry. The Azer Gods. If I have an Azer God in my hand, I have to play it. So if I don't play the same color, it's automatically going to have a zero power value. And at the end of your hands, you collect a pile, whoever has the highest point. And then you play until you have no more cards in hand, and that's the end of the round. You play multiple rounds until a winner reaches the amount of points required to win the game. But there is other ways to get points than just playing the power. There is combos like we mentioned. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a sample hand, and we're going to show you how you set up one of these games. So let's clear the play area. Mm -hmm. Every player at the table would gain a hand of eight cards. Eight so cards. in a two-player game, we'll deal each other eight cards. So what do mm -hmm. we have? Four, five six, seven, eight. And then there are three cards that are laid down in the middle, mm -hmm. and these are your treasure cards. So these are cards that you're going to, the highest bidder is going to win. So the game begins with a bidding round. Bidding begins to the left of the dealer. So it'll go to you, Ken, to give the first bid. Now, basically what you would do first is look at your hand. See if you have any combos like I'm in. So I do have a combo in my hand. I have Avarice and Goveg. So I actually want to check what else I have. So do I have a bunch of green cards so that when this becomes Trump, I want to be able to maybe bid more. Do I have any other cards that might require more combo pieces? For example, I have, um, what's his name? Hun Hung. Hrugnir. Hrugnir? Jeez, I can't read. And you're near. So I want to see if I can maybe collect some pieces in there and try to get those combo pieces. So I'll start off with a pretty high one because I already have a combo. So I figured 100 points, I can probably make that fairly easy. So that would be 100. He bids 100. I'm going to take a look here. I really don't have much in terms of this hand. Bidding would increase normally by 10 points. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could say 110, 120, yeah. you know, anything within 10 point increments that's higher than your bid. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in this case, I'm going to pass. Okay. So another cool thing is if you have a lot of combos in your hand and there's more players, you can try to get someone to bid a lot. Since you know you have a lot of combo pieces in your hand, the chance of someone having a lot of combos is going to be really low. So you can actually try to make them bid more than they can actually chew. So Bluffing. That, exactly. Because there is a downside to bidding. It's not just, oh, there's no downside to bidding. You actually have to make that many points that round or you actually lose that many points. That's so scary. you don't want to go too crazy. So let's say I collect this. So you reveal? I reveal them. So everyone gets to see what the, the cards were. Yes. And then Ken gets to add them to his hand to mm -hmm. optimize his hand. So he has eight cards in his hand. And then um, he's going to discard three cards down into his winnings pile already, face down. Mm -hmm. Meaning he scores those points. So he doesn't necessarily need to keep the high point value cards in his hand. Some, yeah. some of them could go into his winnings pile if there's a danger of losing. The more players that are playing at the table, the more certainty there are that all the cards are in players' hands. Mm -hmm. The fewer the players, the more uncertainty there is because we don't know if you know the high cards in every single suit mm -hmm. are in here or in our opponent's hands. Yes. The more players you have, the higher the chance that every single one of these cards is used. Yes. So basically when you're choosing what to pick, in my opinion, I would rather throw the cards that I don't have any other suit in my hand. So that, that way, when it comes to me having to fight with those, I won't really need to play them as much. So at least if I want to combo off, I'll be able to just play a bunch of cards in my own suit. So if I want to fight, so I'm going to put these three and most likely probably one of the lower end cards like this one, or maybe even Luffy. But you want to keep maybe one or two low end cards so that if he does play some of the higher end cards, you can just drop the lower end cards so that they won't be able to beat you. So. Uh, just for this sake, we're just going to pick these three. I'm going to automatically get these three, four... No, that's point is here. Yeah, same thing. Three, four, seven points automatically plus the three at the end. So 10 points automatically. So this is already into my pool for the points when I count it at the end of this round. So I'm, I'm the one who goes first. You right? lead off. So you get the advantage by being the high bidder. Mm -hmm. You lead off, meaning... We, the rest of the players at the table need to follow suit. Exactly. So if I want to start it off, so generally you want to start by playing one of the higher cards in the end because let's say I played a seven here. If he plays a combo, it's still going to be your turn because you're the one who won the pile. So at least that way you can kind of counter up. So I'm going to go ahead and play what's here? Seven what's power? Here? Yeah. Yes. Seven power. It's only going to give me one point, but in this situation, like we saw, he has seven power. He's going to drop his lowest because he knows he's going to lose. So that I we have to follow suit, right? Exactly. So I'm going to throw you the card that's least valuable. Exactly. Bang. Now it's my turn again. I can probably drop another So that card. was the trick. Yes. So once everyone is thrown, everyone around the table has thrown one card into the middle, mm -hmm. the, the cards in the middle are called a trick for those who haven't played trick-taking games before. Exactly. Now this is where it becomes a problem. Do I want to play my combo to guarantee the, pro the point? But he might be able to beat it. But you can see right here you have a 5 and a 6 in your hand already. The chance of him getting the last 5, especially in a 2-player game, is low. So I'm going to risk it. I'm going to go ahead and play bang. I'm going to show you Goveg. I'm going to show you Avarice. And I'm going to go ahead and keep Avarice in my hand in case you do win that round. And I will be able to, you will only get three points compared to the four points. Exactly, you got it. So you just scored 50 points. So exactly. whatever you have here, you just sealed in another 50 exactly. points into the game, into your into your game. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a higher card, yes. so I'm going to drop something with a higher strength. Mm -hmm. So you could have played the seven to bait out exactly. my, my greens, right? Because seven and six probably yeah, would have yeah. won. But here for the sake of the example, we're kind of showing how the, some of the back and forth exactly. would go. So now that I've won a trick, I get to lead off. Mm -hmm. So maybe I want to go back and play some dwarves. Yes, exactly. Now, if you have any dwarves, you have to play the yes. dwarves. Since you don't have any dwarves, you're open to playing the reds. But the reds would lose because mm -hmm. they're not mm -hmm. the dwarven clan. Yes. However, you do have supremacy with exactly. the Vanir cards. So you could drop one of those. doesn't matter what the number is here. He ends up beating my dwarf card. Exactly. If we're, let's say, we were in a three player game and another player had, let's say, do we have like a higher? No, I had the other higher ones in my hand. So let's say hypothetically he has yeah, this card. Yeah, hypothetically, like let's just do a quick swap. Mm -hmm. So a third player would have thrown this in. Well, dwarf obviously lost. Now it's going to be one of the two green cards that wins this trick because Eager was a six and Golveg was a four. Whoever played the six would scoop those exactly. into their winning spot. And then they would go ahead and play their combo if they had one in their hand. All right, boom. So in this situation, I would claim it and I would get all the points. And it's it's coming down to where I have a lot of the green trumps. So if I want, I would actually have to play either this to try to collect the points. But, you know, in this situation, we'll just play the red one. Maybe he has one. We'll try to bait out his red. If not... He's going to have to play his red. So I've got a red. So what we just played was an example of a supremacy by one player. Now let's set up an example where 
there's a supremacy in play, and we're going to play a second supremacy to mm -hmm. change the trump condition in the game. Mm -hmm. So again, let's let's deal out a hand to one another. So in this quick exchange of tricks, what we're going to show you is the supremacy bouncing between two different players. Yes. So let's assume Ken was the high bidder, and he won all of these cards mm -hmm. already, did his optimization. We've obviously doctored our hands to show this example. So go ahead, Ken, lead us off. So in this, I'm going to reveal these two combo pieces. So I'm going to actually take this one back in my uh, take this this one back in my hand. Now the blue is going to be supremacy. Now it would be your turn to play a card to try to counter up. So the Rhyme Mutants, I'll throw a six down, so I'll win this hand. Mm -hmm. And then I have an interesting combo here, which mm -hmm. is a combo between two characters that belong to two different clans. Mm -hmm. So we have Laufei and Thiasi. Yes. Uh, they're low cards in each clan. They score for 60 points. And depending on the card that I leave at the table, that'll be the color that gains supremacy, yes. that clan. So let's say I'll leave, I don't know, Thiasi at the table. Mm -hmm. And so now Fire Giants, the Muspeliotans, are supreme. Yes. Now And no longer, the uh, and the Rhyme Giants are no longer supremacy. They're treated as any other clan right yeah. now. In that situation, you would have to look at your hand, see what you have the most of, you know, because let's say that's the power is, is one. So that's going to be the lowest power. So you got to make sure that no one can actually beat it. Like, for example, like we just did right before, I can go ahead and play this two right here. That will beat it. It's yep. the second lowest in the game. And I would claim this pile, and it would go to my turn. And then I can play another combo to change it as well. So it does go a lot of back and forth, especially if a lot of people have combos. I can change the color, and so on and so forth. So it does become very interesting the way you get points and all that cool stuff. It never plays the same way twice is what I find. You can play hundreds, if not thousands, of games of Gulveg. And even with just 35 cards, the amount of combos and how they're played really keeps this game fresh in terms of a trick-taking game. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're not bidding on the number of tricks, mm -hmm. we've solved one of the problems that's kind of boring in trick-taking games, where when someone has a run in a suit, so like you've got, you know, seven, six, five, four, three in, in one clan, someone just running through that yeah. is kind of boring when mm -hmm. you're playing a traditional card game because you're like, oh, it's a foregone conclusion. However, because the points are built in such a way that it's exponential, so the early tricks generate almost no points, mm -hmm. but the highest tricks, uh, the, end. So the end tricks, give you the kingmaker points. If you've got to run in a suit, it doesn't matter yeah. because you might lose your bid because you don't have those last tricks, which could be like 50, 60, 70 points. All right, that's it for today. That was a quick overview of how the game is played. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and found this helpful. If you did, hit that like button. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to get posted on all our future videos. And hit us up on Patreon because you'll get all this content. Uh, you'll get all this content early. Skull! Skull! Wait, what?